so I just saw the new Charlie Kaufman film, I'm Thinking of Ending Things, and it was pretty amazing. Much like his directorial debut, Synecdoche, New York, this is a film that you haven't really watched if you've only seen it once. It's not even really all that complex of a story, it's just a film that doesn't really hold your hand as you watch it. At the end of my first watch, I could understand ideas that the film was going for, but I didn't really know what was going on. After seeing the film three times now, I'm pretty confident that I have the vast majority of the film figured out. And I should mention that I don't just automatically love a film simply for being confusing. I didn't watch the film three times in order to enjoy it. I watched the film three times because I enjoyed it. The tone of this film is both mesmerizing and very unsettling. There's a lot of skill when it comes to the direction and cinematography. This is also the same cinematographer that's worked with Pavel Pavlikovsky on Ida and Cold War. The editing in this film is both uncomfortable and very purposeful. The performances in this film are all amazing. Tony Collette and David Thewlis absolutely knock it out of the park with their characters, and their performances are greatly complemented by the detail in the makeup department. They even change Tony Collette's teeth between younger and older versions of her character. Once again, the makeup complements their performances. I've seen a few movies where actors will be put in old age makeup, but they don't quite nail the older performance. In this film, there is just so much detail in their performances. Their voice, their posture, their body language, everything comes together perfectly. In some ways, this film kind of feels like a horror movie, and in other ways, it feels like a depressing existential drama. This isn't really a fast-paced film, but I never felt bored. There's a lot of conversation in this movie, but given the story they're telling, it makes perfect sense. This film is kind of a small-scale story, but at the same time, it isn't. I guess you could say it's a bit of a synecdoche. There are small ideas that are used to make greater statements from. The music in this film is also well done. It is very well composed and appropriately used and never feels overbearing. All of the technical aspects of this film are pretty flawless overall. Now, there's a lot I want to say about this movie, but I can't because it would be spoiling the experience of figuring things out for yourself. So if you don't want to be spoiled for this movie, click to this part in the video. I'm going to offer my full analysis and I guess explanation of what I feel is going on in the film. There's your warning, three, two, one. The first thing you need to understand about this film is that the janitor character and Jake are the same person. The story we're seeing with Jake and the female lead is taking place inside the janitor's head. At the beginning of the film, when we see the janitor looking out the window and it cuts to the female lead, as it cuts back, you can tell that the actor has been changed to Jesse Plemons, who is Jake. The recurring phrase in the film, I'm thinking of ending things, not only refers to the female lead wanting to end the relationship, but it also refers to the janitor character wanting to end his life. He is an old and sad character filled with regret and psychological issues, and the story we see with Jake and the female lead is essentially him fantasizing about what could have been in his life. The conversations between these two characters are essentially conversations that he's having with himself in his head. He has created this fantasy to distract himself from the looming thought of suicide that is growing in his mind. When these two characters enter the vehicle, it is clear that Jake can essentially hear her thoughts. I'm thinking of ending things. Huh? What? Did you say something? No, I don't think so. There are some that have criticized this film for feeling as though the conversations that these two characters have with each other are essentially just an extension of the writer's beliefs. But what's clever about this film is that it's supposed to sound like one person talking to himself in his mind. The conversations between these characters are all happening in the janitor's head as he gets ready and leaves for work and cleans the school. When Jake adjusts the radio in his car, we can see that it's actually not the interior of his car, but that of the janitor truck. In both of the vehicle scenes, there are quick shots where we can see the female lead turning around in her seat as though someone's watching her, and when she recites the poetry about returning home, she stares directly into the camera at both us, the viewer, and the janitor character. It's, it's like... it's like you wrote it about me. Because the female lead in this film is essentially constructed out of the janitor's fantasy, the poetry that she claims is her own is one that actually already exists. And same goes for the paintings she shows on her phone. These are essentially just plucked from the memory of this janitor character. Her backstory also changes throughout the film. At one point in the film, she says she needs to leave in the morning because of a paper she needs to write for school. And at another point in the film, she says she has to leave because she has a shift at a diner she works at. At points in the film, she says she 
grew up in a farmhouse, and at another point in the film, she says she grew up in an apartment. At one point, she's studying biology, and at another point, she's studying film, and at another point, she's studying physics. This constantly shifting character is the result of this janitor's fantasies. He is essentially testing the waters with hypothetical scenarios in his head. What would my parents think if I brought a girl home who was a painter? What would my parents think if I brought a girl home who was studying physics? This is the janitor trying to imagine several different versions of what could have been. At one point her accent changes and she suddenly has a cigarette. At another point she completely changes into the woman from the film the janitor was watching. Earlier in the film they mentioned that films can replace your thoughts like a virus. Everything wants to live, Jake. Viruses are just one more example of everything. But... Even fake, crappy movie ideas want to live. Like, they grow in your brain. And they also call back to this virus line shortly after she transforms into the woman from the film. Pre-interpreted for us, and it infects our brains. We become it. There's also a point where the story of how they met is infiltrated by the film he was watching. It's a sweet story. I asked her about uh, Santa Fe Burger. <laughs> <laughs> when we see the janitor watching the film, it transitions into us watching the film ourselves. Not only is this a way to signify that we are back inside the janitor's head, but it's also a clever tie-in to the philosophical ideas presented throughout the film. Maybe think of yourself as the person looking out at the scene. You might have to see me in them. Well, if you were there, you wouldn't see yourself, right? Everything is tinged. It's tinged. Colored by mood, by emotion, by past experience. There is no objective reality. The choices made in this film are purposeful towards the idea that everything we're seeing is inside the janitor's mind. He very clearly feels a lot of resentment towards his parents. The ways they act in the film are essentially versions of all of the annoyances he's had with them. His seemingly random outbursts at his parents are the culmination of many years of this same thing. When he responds to them in frustration, it is essentially him saying what he's thinking. He holds a lot of negative emotion towards his parents and often finds himself frustrated by them. Why didn't we get the genius? There is no! Perhaps he never responded to them so aggressively in real life, but this is an extension of what he's thinking and feeling. This is also why he was so hesitant to enter the farmhouse once he got there. So, uh, I'm not, I'm not ready to go in. I, I need to stretch my legs, long legs. This is the janitor character not being ready to revisit the memory of his parents in his own mind. Even once he's inside, there are several points where he stands at the bottom of the stairs waiting for them to come down as though he's ready to face them, but he changes his mind. The age of his parents changed throughout the farmhouse scene, and each version of his parents is one that has already existed in his life. At this point, they are both deceased, and the janitor currently lives in the same farmhouse. You can even see the same wallpaper when he's getting ready for work in the morning, there is a level of sadness that comes with him thinking about his parents and their eventual deterioration into old age. As he's attempting to feed his elderly mother, the female lead compliments him for being a good son. Glad to hear you say that. That makes me feel better. Sometimes it feels like no one sees the good things you do. This is the janitor longing for someone to love and appreciate him. And shortly after, when the female lead is walking down the stairs, we can see that the janitor is criticizing his own thoughts and fantasies. Jake needs to see me as someone who sees him. He needs to be seen and he needs to be seen with approval. Like that's my purpose in all this, in life, to approve of Jake keep him going. The janitor is a character that struggles with self-hatred, and even in his longing for emotional connection and stability, he finds ways to put himself down. He is now beating himself up in his own head as though his own desires are that of selfishness. This happens again later when the two are kissing in the car outside the school. There was, there was someone watching us? I didn't see anyone. Well, he was watching us like, like a goddamn pervert. Let's go. Oh, I'm very familiar yeah, with know. that. Particular look. Jake. At this point, Jake rushes into the school to essentially confront himself because he's angry that this part of his fantasy has essentially become sexualized. Even in his own fantasies, they always revert back to him hating himself. He is old and alone and filled with regret. In one of the conversations with his parents, they talk about old age being a fast train to hell. In a conversation in the car after they leave, Jake talks about the struggles of old age. On a first watch, this might seem as though he's worried for the future, but this is actually something that he's experiencing as the janitor. Hearing your sight, you can't see, and you're invisible. You have some 
made so many wrong turns. It is this regret over his own life and the choices that he's made that is driving him to be suicidal. And this fantasy that he's living in his head as he's working is his attempt to keep his mind off of suicide. But no matter how hard he tries, this pervasive thought keeps working its way back into his mind. In one of the conversations in the car, the female lead talks about moving through time as though it's Mussolini's train. You can always jump off a train. In movies, in real life, you'll probably die jumping from a moving train. And at points in the film where the thought begins to take hold, the scene quickly changes. Now we're both dead. Ta -da. It's as though the janitor is changing the scene in his mind to keep himself from thinking these thoughts. Jake. Dear. The phone calls that the female lead receives in the film are this exact pervasive thought from the janitor. There's only one question to resolve. I'm scared. I feel a little crazy. I'm not lucid. The assumptions are right. I can feel my fear growing. Now is the time for the answer. Just one question. No matter how many times the janitor tries to ignore this thought, it keeps creeping itself back into his mind. I'm thinking of ending things. Once this thought arrives, it stays. It sticks lingers, it dominates. There's not much I can do about it. Trust me. When the characters arrive at the ice cream shop, the young girl with rashes communicates that she's worried for them. I don't have to go where? Forward. In time. You, you, you can stay here. Very scary. What are you scared about? I'm scared for you. This is a part of the janitor's consciousness that knows he's going to kill himself by the end of the day. She's scared of time moving forward because she knows where it will inevitably take him. This girl was also shown earlier in the film as the janitor walked by her. It is clear that he feels a sort of kinship with this girl that he's probably never even talked to. He notices that she is bullied herself and he feels a connection with her. This is further illustrated by Jake also having a rash on his hand when he gives her money. And the other two girls at the ice cream shop were shown mocking the janitor earlier in the film. The characters in this fantasy reveal the insecurities that the janitor experiences. Even in his own mind, he doesn't want to face their judging eyes. He is ashamed of who he is and these girls are a constant reminder. This is also why Jake didn't want the female lead going into the basement. It is in this basement that he's buried the reality of who he truly is. As shown by the female lead pulling out the janitor's uniform from the washing machine. It is in this same basement we see that Jake Jake once had artistic ambitions that he never followed through on. This is a character that doesn't want to be reminded of his current situation. Almost all groundbreaking work in science and the arts is done by young people. Old people are the ash heap. Listen, Jake, I'm thinking that we need to- Ta-da! Throughout this fantasy, it's clear that Jake doesn't want the female lead to leave. He wants to linger in his head without time going forward because he knows where time will take him. It is only once his thoughts are plagued with his mother's death that he decides he's ready to leave. We should go. It's getting treacherous. On his way to drop her back off in the city, he tries to buy some time by visiting the ice cream shop and then the school. As they approach the school, it's clear that Jake is very knowledgeable about this building. 130 classrooms, gymnasium. Two locker rooms, boys, girls. The janitor cleans this school every day, so it makes sense that he'd have this information. You certainly know your high school. The back of my hand. And if you didn't notice in this shot, his hand is very old looking. After Jake leaves the car to confront himself about the momentary sexualization of his own fantasy, we can see through the female lead that the janitor is still beating himself up in his mind. Sometimes you're just caught off guard, and the request comes, can I have your number? And the easiest way out of it is just to say yes, and then that yes turns into more yes, and then it's yes, yes, yes. He is now treating this fantasy relationship as though he's manipulated her into staying with him, and now his mind is inevitably drifting back towards suicide. How long did it take me to hypothermia? Huh? Maybe it's not a bad way to go if I have to go. This method of suicide was also hinted at earlier in the film with the frozen lambs. I mean, they're already dead, so what else can happen to them? Well. I mean, will they be burned? Probably be burned. She eventually leaves the car and heads towards the school where she sees an entire dumpster full of the ice cream from earlier. Perhaps this is a way to show that the janitor has had this fantasy many times. Once inside, she asks the janitor if he's seen her boyfriend, and when asked to describe him, she goes on quite the revealing monologue. We never even talked, is the truth. I'm not even sure I registered him. There was a lot of people. I was there with my girlfriend, 
we were celebrating our anniversary, stopped in for a drink, and then this guy kept looking at me. It is at this moment that the janitor comes to terms with this sad reality. She is merely a constructed fantasy of a person that he never even dated. He didn't have the courage to ask for her number, and he's now beating himself up in his own mind. He was a creeper, you know? I, I, I remember thinking, I wish my boyfriend was here. There's no way the janitor could have known that she had a boyfriend, but he still put that in his fantasy because of his self-hatred. I can't remember what he looks like. Why would I? There are several points in the film where she says things like, why would I know that? This is another example of the janitor creating this fantasy in his head and thinking about what the character would realistically know. It feels like I've known Jake longer than I have. What has it been? Uh, a month? Six weeks? Maybe seven. I should know exactly. I'll say seven weeks. She says that she's worried about Jake, and the janitor says that he's safe if he's in the school. This might be because he knows he plans to kill himself as soon as he leaves. As long as he's in the school, he'll be safe. This might also explain why he's still there cleaning at such a late hour. The janitor offers her slippers, and she refuses, saying, no, they're yours. This is something that also happened when they entered the farmhouse. As the janitor comes to terms with the reality that this woman is something that he'll never have for himself in his life, his fantasy winds up taking the form of a choreographed dance. He watches the dancers representing the younger version of himself and the young woman as they fall in love and get married, and a dancer representing the janitor shows up and tries to take the girl for himself. Unfortunately, she belongs to the fantasy, and it is not something that he can ever have. And it should be noted that within this fantasy, he is portraying his current self as the villain. As the three of them struggle, snow falls within the gymnasium. The snow and cold weather in this film is being used as a metaphor for the inevitability of moving forward in time. We're stationary, and time passes through us, blowing like cold wind, stealing our heat, leaving us chapped and frozen. What are you thinking? I don't know. The inevitable passage of time is inherent to the struggles in his life. He wouldn't feel so hopeless and defeated if he wasn't so old. If there was time to try again and change things and make new decisions and try meeting someone, instead he is filled with regret knowing that he's wasted his life, and this manifests into hatred for himself. At the end of this scene, the dancer representing the janitor stabs the dancer representing Jake. It's possible that this is to show that the janitor realizes that he is at fault for for this version of reality not existing. And then we see the janitor sweeping up the fragments of his fantasy. He finishes cleaning at the school and then heads out to his truck where he wipes the snow off the windows. And as soon as he's about to put the keys in the ignition, the pervasive thought returns and he sets them on the seat instead. From this point on, we experience the death of this character. The shots fade to imply passage of time. We see him shivering as he's going through memories in his head. Soon we see the janitor frantically removing his clothes. This is a a symptom of hypothermia called paradoxical undressing. When your body loses enough heat, you become disoriented and confused. People often feel too hot and undress themselves, and others experience hallucinations. And now we see the janitor is experiencing hypothermia-induced hallucinations. Through these hallucinations, he comes to terms with his own mortality. Someone has to be a big infested with maggots, right? It might as well be you. It's the luck of the draw. You play the hand you're dealt, you make lemonade, you, you move on. You don't worry about a thing. This pig infested with maggots was also referenced earlier in the film when he was showing her the barn. We then see Jake on a stage with what appears to be a Nobel Peace Prize on the podium. Perhaps this is in reference to him making peace with death. He says that he accepts it all and then looks out to the audience and says, I'm only here because of you. This scene is nearly identical to the ending of A Beautiful Mind, and this film is also seen on the shelf in his bedroom in his mind. Here we see other things that he keeps on his mental shelf, the ways people have looked at him, lost and abandoned friendships, lasting memories of sorrow, futile efforts at success, unforgettable mishaps, missed opportunities, huge disappointments, and humiliations. We see all of the characters in the film in the audience, and everyone is wearing old age stage makeup. It's possible that this is to show that as his own mind and body are deteriorating, he's bringing everyone in his mind along with him. <laughs> Now we're both dead. It's also important to note the line that we hear when the film cuts to the female lead in the audience. Physical, metaphysical, delusional, 
and back. Jake then says, I'm only here because of you. You are the reason I am. You are all my reasons. We then see Jake perform the song Lonely Room from the musical Oklahoma. It was mentioned earlier in the film that Jake is very familiar with this particular musical. But I know Oklahoma best, I guess. They do it every few years for obvious reasons. I mean, who does it every few years? He knows this musical well because he's seen it performed at the school play so many times over the years. And in the clip that we do see of him watching rehearsals, the lyrics are incredibly relevant. Many a new face will please my eye. Many a new love will find me. Never have I asked an August sky. Where has last two the lyrics of this song convey that she's not worried about the passage of time and there's plenty of opportunity for her to find love. And because those issues are so present in his own mind, those particular lyrics wind up standing out to him and interrupting his fantasy. If you listen carefully, you can hear that this is the exact same song playing on the radio just before it cuts to him cleaning up during rehearsals. But I know Oklahoma best, I guess. They do it every few years for obvious reasons. This is more evidence to support that this film is being told in order from the perspective of his own mind. It's also worth mentioning that the dancing we saw earlier has many similarities to the dream ballet sequence in this same musical. The song that Jake sings is one that is performed by the character Judd Fry in the musical, and although I have not seen Oklahoma, this character is described as a mysterious and dangerous loner. The lyrics in this song evoke strong feelings of loneliness and isolation. The lyrics also describe the character waking up from a fantasy they had about being with the girl of their dreams. Once the musical number is over, the audience stands up and applauds as Jake is brought to tears. The shot slowly fades to blue and then fades back into what appears to be the next day outside the school. Here we can see the janitor's truck is covered in snow and Jake's car is nowhere to be found. Now whether or not the janitor succeeded in killing himself would depend on whether or not he actually followed the pig into the school. And even if he did, it's entirely possible that his hypothermia would have reached the point of no return and he still died in the school. Part of me feels as though the fade to blue is a way to signify that the character died, much like the slow fade to gray at the end of Synecdoche, New York. It's worth mentioning that you can hear the engine of another vehicle near the end of the end credits sequence. Perhaps this is someone showing up to the school the next day trying to get through the snow. So yeah, I'm not 100% sure whether or not the janitor was successful in his suicide, so feel free to let me know how you interpret it. Anyway, I loved this movie quite a lot. It's a film that really stuck with me and I've been thinking about it ever since my first watch. I love films that get better the more times you see them. Even just going over the film while recording this review, I noticed more to appreciate. Not only is everything about this film amazing on a technical level, but the choices that it makes are so purposeful towards what it's trying to achieve. The choices for the structure and editing are not just unique and interesting, they are incredibly important for the story that it's telling. I absolutely loved this film and would recommend that everybody watch it at least twice. It's certainly not a movie that everyone will love, but it really connected with me. Charlie Kaufman's films are ones that really speak to me on a deep emotional level, and I sincerely hope that he's able to get more projects made in the future. And I'm giving this one a 10 out of 10. Hey guys, just a quick update on the Lion King YMS video. It is not going to be out this month of September. It is, I'm, a I'm aiming for October because uh, I forgot that I was doing film festival stuff in September. I didn't even know how many film festivals I'd be able to do with this whole COVID thing and them being online, but I managed to get uh, press accreditation for Fantasia and TIFF and Ver Van 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 Vancouver Film Festival. So that's three film festivals all within the span of basically a month. So I'm watching a lot of movies. I've watched all the movies that I, uh, from, from Fantasia. So I'll be making quickies on a bunch of those uh, as I'm continuing to watch other films and edit through my Lion King video. Uh, it's already an hour long. Uh, so yeah, it's it, it's looking like it's probably going to be like two hours. It's not, I, I'm not at the end of it, that's for sure. So be patient. And uh, to put it into perspective, uh, I've even with just the Kimba video this year, I've already released way more YMS content than the previous year and the year before that, and the year before that, uh, in terms of overall minutes. And so I, it, it's looking like I'm about to double that before the year is over. So there's some perspective for you. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I'm working on it. I'm trying my best. And uh, after that's finished, then uh, Synecdoche part six, and I'll finish 
that review up that was started a long time ago. And uh, yeah, stay tuned. Anyway, just a quick update. Film festival stuff is important to me. It's the only thing making me feel like a bit of normalcy during this whole pandemic. So yeah, you'll see some quickie reviews for a bunch of those things and I'll record a new commentary soon also. Thank you so much. Love you guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>